Are you a true crime addict? Do you find yourself talking serial killers and missing persons at parties only to be met with uncomfortable smiles? Well, find your tribe on True Crime Snack Time, a daily podcast that gives you a little true crime snack to chew on. From January 1st to December 31st, you'll find out what happened on this day in true crime. Short, sweet, and chock full of crime. Join me, Allison, on True Crime Snack Time. We're available wherever you get your favorite podcasts. Follow True Crime Snack Time on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram at Crime Snack Pod. And remember, keep your friends close and your snacks closer. This is True Consequences, a true crime and mystery podcast with stories based in New Mexico in the American Desert Southwest. If you enjoy listening to this show, please rate, subscribe, and review. True Consequences is fully listener-supported. To support the show, go to patreon.com slash trueconsequences. To keep up with all my updates, you can follow me on Facebook and Instagram at trueconsequencespod and on Twitter at trueconspod. The following episode discusses themes which may be difficult for some listeners. It deals with issues of domestic violence, child abuse, neglect, and child murder. Listener discretion is advised. If you or someone you know is a victim of domestic violence, please call the National Domestic Violence Hotline at 1-800-799-7233. To report child abuse or suspected child abuse in New Mexico, please call 1-855-333-SAFE or dial pound SAFE from a mobile device. That's pound S-A-F-E from your mobile device. In part one of Jacob's story, you heard about his case and how he was murdered by my stepfather. You learned about how my stepfather terrorized my mom and I for years. This episode is a follow-up to episode one. For context, my mother and I went to a cold case investigator to have this case looked at again in 2004. We weren't aware of the status of this secondary investigation until I requested the documents for this case in January of this year. As a result of this request, I received close to 200 pages of documents related to the investigation. I learned a lot from these documents. Most notably, I learned that this case is, in fact, closed. I became extremely emotional, as you can imagine. Learning that no one is willing to prosecute this case was more than heartbreaking for me. The most frustrating part of this discovery was learning that the cold case investigator stated, and I quote, Suspect was arrested in 1992 and charged with that offense, but after his arrest, it appears that nothing else occurred after the initial filing of the criminal charge, and I have been unable to determine why this had occurred, as records no longer exist. There was sufficient evidence in this investigator's opinion to prove that he knew of Jacob's recent head injury, which occurred several weeks before the incident which resulted in Jacob's death. The suspect should have been more attentive to Jacob's needs. He did negligently and without justifiable cause place Jacob in a situation that endangered his life. He knew of Jacob's prior injury and combined with the fact that he changed his story of events several times during the investigation, which were not witnessed by anyone else. The fact alone draws a lot of suspicion to any story he tells after his initial statement. The incident which resulted in Jacob's death occurred one way, not the two or three ways as told by the suspect. He knew he needed to be much more attentive to Jacob's needs, as Jacob was only nine months old, and still in need of almost constant supervision. The suspect failed to do this. The problem with this investigation at this time is the statute of limitations. And in this investigator's opinion, if this is not overcome, there cannot be a successful criminal prosecution in this matter. We also have a speedy trial issue. He was arrested in 1992, and it appears that the criminal charge was never pursued by the state. End quote. When the cold case investigator requested follow-up from the current DA, he was told that the DA was not interested in prosecuting this case. Here is an excerpt 
from the letter the DA's office sent to the cold case investigator. Quote, Mr. Burrell had reviewed several times the material that was sent to him concerning the events surrounding the death of Jacob Lundin. Jacob Lundin's death occurred in Socorro County, New Mexico, in April of 1987. Mr. Burwell had determined that there is insufficient evidence at this time to proceed with a felony prosecution. The letter also stated that Mr. Burrell is of the opinion that the extreme age of the matter, coupled with the statute of limitations, which was in effect at the time of Jacob Lundin's death, would by itself make it impossible to proceed with a prosecution in this case. No evidence was maintained or seized during this investigation. The case is now considered closed. End quote. As you can imagine, this was extremely frustrating for me to learn. I was not aware that the case was closed. I knew that the case was cold, but I was always under the impression that it was still an open case. I am still choosing to edit out the suspect's name because I'm hopeful that I can have this case reopened either by the district attorney or the attorney general's office. Today, I'm joined by my friend Lydia and her friend Edna. Edna is a former prosecutor for the state of New Mexico. In this episode, Edna tries to help me understand the case more. And in the follow-up to this episode, you will hear some corrections to what was discussed today. I do have to apologize for the sound quality. Myself, Edna, and Lydia were all at a very busy restaurant in Albuquerque to discuss the case. And as a result, I had to work pretty hard to edit out the background noise so that you could hear what we're talking about. It did garble the audio a little bit. I apologize for that, but I hope you can look past it and really listen closely to what we are discussing. Because I did learn a lot about our justice system in the state. And I definitely feel strongly that there is a lot that has to be changed. I had many suspicions about that. But this became very clear after my conversations with Edna. I am Eric Carter Landine, and this is True Consequences. I ran Mr. and he doesn't have any other criminal history, which is really quite remarkable to me. Yeah. Um, particularly because your mom talked about him strangling her, yeah. which is um, a predicate for violence. Well, it's a predicate, and it's probably the highest indicator for lethality yeah. to the domestic violence yeah. victims, and it's also a high indicator for child abuse. Yeah. Do you know a lot about like so- Socorro? Like, I mean, I know there? I know enough to know that. Um, I mean, I have this crazy fucking case down there. It's very much like a, a boys club down there. Like, if women call the police, they'll come out. And yeah. the guy, usually the abuser is the man. He'll, like, talk to the police. Like, she's just getting all crazy, bro. I'm just trying to, like... That's happened, like, that happened all the time with my mom. Anytime she called the police. Yeah. Works so, like, for the county as yeah. well. He was buddy buddy with everybody. Yeah, you're related to everybody. You and he was from there. Yeah. But was your mom from there? Yeah. And so had they known each other growing up? Yeah. And um, they known each other their whole lives. My dad and we're best friends. Work. Work. I think your mom said that. Yeah. And um, um. Anyway, I was really surprised to see no criminal history. There's there's zero doubt in my mind that he has continued to abuse 100%. other women. Delayed. And he's still alive. He is. Yeah. And he's married to another woman. Uh, and so what were the age of, of, the, of his other children to you? His other children. So is a year older than me. Okay. And then I think is one or two years younger than me. And do you have contact with those kids? So the Mrs. and they're referring to here is your mom. Yeah. So in this where she says that you dropped, you dropped Jacob. Um, yeah. You, you did not. Yeah. yeah. 
do you remember telling her that you had? Okay. I remember telling her that I kicked him in the head, but I also remember he was sitting right across from me, like saying, "Don't lie, yeah, don't lie," yeah. yeah. like over and over again. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You know what you did. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I don't ask you that because I think you did it. I'm just asking. It's, it's really convoluted. It's not. I mean, I don't know if that makes you feel better, but it's not actually that convoluted and it's not actually that abnormal. I mean, in terms of like looking at these types of cases, like everything that you and your mom describe is like a thousand percent normal within those that world within that world so like yeah so like everything that you and your mom experienced is not um i don't go oh my god that's new or different like like i think what people don't understand about like particularly domestic violence and child abuse is that every single one of these guys does the exact same thing they have the exact same way of um manipulating and and covering up and but also just acting they all act exactly the same way and so it's like whenever I read these cases I'm like this is a hundred percent normal I mean the acts are not normal and the 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 situation is not normal but Uh, but it it, follows the pattern absolutely and so like I would hope that as you kind of work through this for yourself that you take some comfort in that like that you're not alone like you're literally not alone like like you're not like this is totally normal and that's horrible for me to say but it's also I hope makes you feel not isolated or 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 that like what you're doing or saying that like people will not recognize the the humanity in it somehow or like the the truth of it and I mean I think that what I've been doing this 18 years in some varying degrees domestic violence work and I think that people enough people are not telling their story to for other people to be like this is normal I think it's really easy for people to hear this story and think this is abnormal and so therefore it could not have happened this way like they're like this big this there's no way that this horrible thing is true like I think that like I mean, I think that, like, even if he had been prosecuted, like, the likelihood of him getting convicted would be equally slim. Really? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Because people are like, there's no way that somebody would be this horrible. So they're, like, projecting their own, like, moral lens onto other situations, basically? I don't think it's a moral lens. I think it's a... I think it's a... I think it's a denial lens. It's a... It's a... There can't be this many horrible people living amongst us. You know, because, like, I guarantee you that out of all these people in this room, every single woman in here has been impacted by domestic violence and sexual assault. Yeah. There's no doubt in my mind. Sure. So we know that. Right. So we know that about the women. The same can be said of the men. There's probably just as many offenders in here as there are victims. Right? There are guys that are doing this kind of thing. It's horrible. And so, like, I think that when you really start to to frame the world in that way, it becomes easier to hold these people accountable because they're the, they're more the norm than the anomaly. And so, for me, I'm like, we have to we have to normalize the at. It's not abnormal. We have to normalize the horror to get people to really be like, okay, this is happening. Because this is normal. Everything that your mom was describing is what every single victim of domestic violence describes. I've heard that story thousands of times in thousands of different ways by thousands of different women. I mean, it, it's so typical. It's so normal. And so, like, but I, and so I think that, like, we don't normalize it. We we treat it as though it is so horrific that therefore And that's just because it's not out there in the public consciousness. Because you because you have your shame about it so you right. don't talk about it. That's true. That's true. You have I mean you like, I, I and so said like that, like in the episode that you know a lot of my friends when they found out that my brother died they would tell me like, Oh I never 
forget you never told me, and it's like, oh, I'm just fucking never tell you, like, it's not like, I'm like, hi, I'm Eric, my brother was murdered, mom was, like, beaten to death almost, it's just not something that I'm comfortable even talking about. Why, though? Because I worry, I think it's, like, it's the same thing that you're saying, like, I worry that I'm gonna freak people out. And they're going to run away and not want to talk to me ever again. And, and the thing is, is that it does freak people out. Yeah. And they do run away. Yeah. Like, like my mom is always like, I don't want to hear about your job. And I'm like, why? It's normal. And she's like, I don't want to hear it. And I'm like, okay, but you have to hear Like, So, uh, the, district, <laughs> the district attorney said that they would not really even try going forward that was in 2005 because of the statute of limitations that were in place in the 80s? Yeah, so um, what I was looking for was just um, the facts of the death because if, if, if they're saying um, and, and I'm not super um, competent with crimes against children but um, so so there used to be a negligently caused and an intentionally caused child abuse. And I was most familiar with um, negligently caused no death or great bodily harm. That's a third degree felony. There's definitely statute of limitations to there to that. What I'm not familiar with is if it's intentionally caused death because I think that that's a I think that that's equivalent to an open count of murder and if if it is equivalent to an open count of murder then there is no statute of limitations and there wouldn't have been at the time either I don't think why is there why is there a differentiation between first degree murder and child abuse resulting in death why is that different because I, that's a really good question, and I don't totally know the answer okay. to that. But first-degree murder intentionally caused is very difficult to prove. Okay. I, I was thinking this morning in the shower that I'm going to talk to my friend about the... Because um, she's an expert she's prosecutor in... Um, they're not traumatic brain injuries. They're concussive head injuries that cause death. Yeah. But... Um, there's always a lot of um, debate about why child abusers who kill kids are not charged with homicide. Yeah. Um, thank you. It has to do with the... Um, my guess is that it has to do with... Um, my guess is it has to do with what you have to... It has to do with the jury instruction. So, if you and I are married, and I kill you, and I get charged with first-degree murder, now, people think that premeditation is a thing, and it is in some states, but it's not in New Mexico. So, it's called first-degree murder, willful and deliberate. And willful and deliberate means it's more than a spur of the moment, but it's less than premeditated. So everybody thinks premeditated. Premeditated takes more than a more than a, um, a weighing of the consequences. We don't have premeditated. We just have like a weighing of the conse- of the consequences for or against a homicide. And so that's a really high standard, and it's really hard to prove. And I think that so so if you kill me or I kill you and I get charged with first degree murder, the state has to prove that I weighed the consequences of my decision. It's really hard to prove, and that I I even in weighing them decided it was still worth it for me to kill you. Child abuse doesn't, they didn't want to create that high of a um, burden. Plus, if I kill you, homicide is charged as an open count, which means that every other count of homicide is contemplated within that, underneath the willful and deliberate. So, a jury trial... I would be entitled to jury instructions that have sufficient provocation 
which drops it from a first degree to a second degree. So sufficient provocation is, um, it's, it's not self-defense because self-defense is an absolute absolvement of the charge. Right. Sufficient provocation is, did you do something that made me just so, did you ask for it? Yeah, did you ask for it, but it's not self-defense, right? So, like, did you did you so inflame my sensibilities? It's 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 a, it's different than a, a heat so of like passion. If mom, like, if mom, like if my mom attacked him and burned him, that would be sufficient provocation. Yes. Okay. Whereas, like, heat of passion is is not really a recognized um, defense in New Mexico. I would also be entitled to um, voluntary manslaughter, which is, I can't remember what voluntary manslaughter is. What class it is? It's a third degree felony, but I can't remember. Um, so voluntary manslaughter is like, did you mean, did you mean to fight them and then they die? Like you didn't intend for them to die, but you meant to fight them. You didn't mean to hurt them. Right. And then involuntary manslaughter is like, um, you and you and I are arguing. I punch you. You fall backwards, hit your head, and die. I meant to punch you, but I didn't mean to kill you. So if I kill you, I am entitled to all of those four different criminal charges, which each have different penalties, and the jury would consider those. I think the reason why they did child abuse resulting in death is a separate charges. They didn't want to entitle the defendant to those instructions. Because juries will always split the baby and go with the lesser crime. Because they feel bad about... Whatever. Yeah. yeah. The higher crime. That's my guess about why they did that. So how did it happen where he was charged, but then nothing happened? So... Typically... Now... Um... It, things have changed, so I would have to go back and research the law for that time period. But so in Albuquerque, uh, if you get arrested, the cops put, the cops set a bond. Uh, the cops would uh, secure an arrest warrant, and the court you would see a judge within 24 hours, and that judge would set a bond. And um, it used to be that the bond would be high enough that you would sit in jail and the DA's office would schedule the case for grand jury very, very quickly within 10 days of your arrest. And in Albuquerque, the grand juries are, they sit all the time. Okay, so there's always a grand jury sitting. This is available, ready to go. Yes. That's not true in other jurisdictions right. around the state. So, people get charged all the time in magistrate court with an, in, with an initial charge, in it, and usually it's just one charge. And it's usually just the highest charge. Right. And the DA knows that... And the reason why there's the reason why we did that in the second judicial district is I didn't want you, the, the defendant, if you get arrested on a homicide charge and a <clears throat> misdemeanor, if I charge you with everything, you could technically go in at your first appearance and say, I'm pleading guilty to the misdemeanors. And if the DA was dumb or not paying attention and agreed to that, double jeopardy would attach and you would never be able to get charged with a higher charge later. So it became pattern, so I'm speculating a little bit of it, but it became pattern in Albuquerque anyway, that you only booked them on the highest charge. Because then they couldn't put it out to anything else because they hadn't been charged with it. And then the GA would sit down with the file and sit down with the case agent, the homicide case agent, and say, we can charge them everything with homicide all the way down to criminal trespassing, like whatever the fuck, just throw everything at them. Well, but because most rural jurisdictions don't have grand juries sitting, most DAs will release them, release the offenders from jail, 
pending a presentation to the grand jury or pending a preliminary hearing. So grand jury, 12 people from the community. State has to pay for them to be there. The proceedings are secret. You never know what's going to happen. The defendant's not allowed to be present. He can testify before the grand jury, but he can't be present for the grand jury. Closed proceeding. If the grand jury no bills it, he's not indicted. The case goes away. Double jeopardy attaches. You never see or hear from him again. Because of the expense related to grand juries, most rural jurisdictions just do binding them over for presentation at a preliminary hearing. The preliminary hearing is in front of a judge. The defendant is there with an attorney. The state prosecutor is there. They have their witnesses. The defense can present any witnesses they have with evidence that might mitigate the charge. And the judge hears all of the evidence. The rules of evidence are a little bit looser, but the judge hears all of the evidence and decides whether or not there's probable cause to hold that person over on the charges. The judge can add charges, take away charges, whatever. Probable cause means are there facts that support a crime has been committed? And do the facts support that this person who is accused is the one who committed those acts? Very low standard. So when you looked it up at NM Courts, I didn't even see it on NM Courts. So that means it wasn't an only cross, it was, there wasn't a bind over. I didn't it's even see that he had ever been even been charged. But I have the warrant. The warrant for arrest. I did the warrant for arrest. Was signed. It does say that he was arrested one night in jail. Are those in here? I believe so. So. I thought I have it at home. Okay. So. <laughs> So I can see that the prosecutor was like, I'm going to bind this over for presentation. Who was it? Clint Wilborn? No, it was uh, Lee's Deschamps, oh, Lee, who's oh. a big defense attorney down there now. Yeah. Yeah. And a lot of times, the problem with that system is that then those people are out of custody, right? Yeah. So they're tampering with witnesses, they're stalking, they're, stalking, they're talking to your mom, they're wooing her, convincing her that you're the bad guy, yeah. whatever was happening, whatever happened, I mean, that shit happens all the time. Yeah. So, my guess is, somehow, during that interim 60 days, okay, so, let me back up. When you get arrested, the magistrate court puts conditions of release on you, or at least they are supposed to. And those conditions of release are usually things like, you know, don't have contact with the witnesses, etc. If the DA does not bring a case within 60 days, the case automatically goes away. So it doesn't get away. It just, it just closes administratively because the jurisdiction over that case is done. And so cases will just LOP. They close for lack of prosecution, which is not a it's not a lack of prosecution by the prosecutor. It's just nobody's doing anything on the case and the courts administratively close them. It's lazy to do it that way. I think the prosecutor should take an action within those sixty days. But it happens all the time in rural jurisdictions that they just let them close. That does not mean, however, that the case cannot then be presented to a grand jury or brought back up for a preliminary examination within the statute of limitations. Okay. Now, the problem, though, and I've seen this happen time and again with other... I've never seen it happen with a homicide, but I'm not surprised at all. Nothing ever happens. You don't know why you don't have any... Yeah, nothing. Nothing. It just evaporates. Yeah. And I can say with relative certainty that it usually happens because nobody cares. Right. They're like, this is a DV. Victim's going to get back together with him. It's a little brand boy. Who cares? If she doesn't care, we don't care. Um, 
All the defendant has to do is throw you under the bus. Nobody's going to prosecute a six, six-year-old, and the jury's going to be like, yeah, little boy, jealous. That's probably the best case scenario. Yeah. Right? Worst case is he was in bed with all these fucking people, and they played a game, and they won. Yeah. Which is my suspicion. I mean... And it could be a mix of both. I mean... One one is definitely more malignant than right. the other. Um, I mean, or it could be a combination. It could be a combination. They thought because of their friendship with him, their pre-existing relationship with him, they thought it was entirely plausible that his version of events was true. That you did this, yeah, and that they thought, well, why are we going to go down this road? And you know, if it's going to end up in an acquittal, anyway. yeah. So let's just act like this didn't happen. And they had his confession. I still don't believe. I read the synopsis of the confession. I don't believe that that's actually what happened either. Because the Office of Medical Investigator report said that the injury was basic. Like, everything that he said could not have made that injury. Him hitting the table, him hitting a chair, him hitting anything else could not have caused that type of injury. What was the injury? Was it subdural hematoma? Subdural hematoma. Yeah. I saw in there that OMI doesn't have photos. According to Christian, they do. He saw the autopsy. He looked at them. Where are they? Probably the state. <laughs> right. Right. Oh them. my house. Awesome. They don't destroy those after a certain period of time, do they? Or do they digitally? I don't think you don't want the photo. I can't. You don't want the photo. I can't look at that. Yeah. 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 That they wouldn't have been destroyed. Would they be digitally preserved? Oh, thank you. Yeah. But, I mean... The, the hard thing about baby deaths... So, this is probably way too much information for you, but... Babies decompose really, 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 really fast. Yeah. And so... If, if, if you get dispatched to a crime scene and there's a dead baby on scene, they will still scoop them up and run with them and try and keep them alive because they they want to get them out of the house so that they can, um, so they don't have to wait for warrants and stuff. So that if the baby's dead, they already want to take them so that when they're at the hospital, they can immediately start preserving their bodies because they just decompose really, really rapidly. Um, and so injuries on kiddos are really weird and, you know, the medical investigator really cannot say hand versus book or but they can say blunt force versus sharp force. It is blunt force. Yeah, so they said blunt force. And 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 where did he say the baby fell on the floor? <laughs> it was first. So I put him on the couch. I was mixing. I was dubbing some tapes, and I heard a noise, and I looked back, and it looked like he fell on the couch, and I think he hit his head on the coffee table. Then it was he started just choking randomly, so I flipped him over and started like hitting him on the back to get him to stop choking, and his head might have hit the chair. Then it turned into I was playing with him very forcefully, and as I was throwing his body around, he hit the chair with his head. So it's all these very different. So that's all sharp force, right? More or less. Oh yes, thank you. I mean, it's sharp force in the sense that they would leave a, a, a mark system. So when, when in death investigations, there are. Lots of different injury pathologies, and um, you're looking, particularly with kiddos, you're looking for injuries that occur in places that don't wouldn't normally be injured. So, do you have kids? You do. How, how old is he? Oh, well, so you've suppressed his toddler youth, the memories of his toddler youth. My son. Yeah. I mean, you don't. Have, you haven't had a kid. You haven't had a toddler in a long oh, time. Oh, like I'm pa- way past. Yeah, that yeah, yeah. You're like. Yeah. Okay, I have a toddler, and that kid is always hurt. Yeah. She's always yeah. got bruises they fall, on it. Whatever. They yeah. Fall. But all of her injuries are where you would expect them. Right. Right. So she doesn't. She doesn't really get injuries on her buttocks. She doesn't get injuries too much, like on her torso. She on her get, back. 
or on her back. She gets them on her knees, her head, her elbows, her nose, her nose. So they're always looking for injuries like that. Right. He did have trauma to his butt. He did? Yeah. It was it wasn't visible um, on the skin, but when they examined closer under the skin, there was um, I think they said it was a hematoma. I'm not sure if it was a hematoma or what, but they did say that there was blood there was blood pooling there from an injury. In terms of a provable case, I mean this would have been a provable, a very provable and case. And that was the, the cold case investigator's opinion too. Yeah. So if he, if in court to show he was never actually charged, you could potentially rule out the, the risk of double jeopardy. Now you have to figure out what the I don't think of, there's a double jeopardy risk right. at all. Now you have to think about what the statute of limitations was, yeah, back then. but that could potentially be augmented if a new prosecutor got created with what he was charged with. Right. So, but the problem really is going to be speedy trial. And that's what they they cited that a few times in that report. Speedy trial has always been the concern. So, who would Eric have to bring this to it, uh, the attention of? Would it be the AG's office? Yeah. Okay. The AG's office. So, how does he do that? Does he write a letter? Does he get support from? So, what I was talking to Eric about was us. Um, if he wants me to help to create basically like a letter that we send to both the AG, the Socorro DA, um, New Mexico and, State Police. And uh, yeah. I do have a contact at New Mexico State Police who's a, she's a, she's like a, she's very high rank. And so what happened, I see the 2005 dates, so you and your mom tried to resurrect this again. Correct. And what happened with that? Um, so basically, that, that's the screenshots I sent you where he said mm-hmm. that it's clear that there, this could have been charged, this could have been prosecuted by the law, but because of the statute of limitations and because the DA is refusing to process, to prosecute this, it's, it's closed. So you and your mom went to who to say, why didn't we you get We went to the full case uh, investigator at the state police. Okay, and who was that? That was this Christian. Christian. Yeah. Is Christian still with the state police? I don't know. Yeah. So, after they gave you this report, what did you guys do with the report? We didn't get the report. Oh, nobody I told you. It. Nobody. Okay. Well, that's not really fair to say that because it's possible that my mom got information and it burned in the fire or she forgot or, you know, like there's... There's only so much energy you can expend at any given point. It's right. like, you get the fire up, you do something, and then you're like, Ugh. So I can't, yeah, so I can't, I can't yeah. say that, that she didn't... No, that the case is closed. Okay. And you, you talked about you no. talked about going to see my mom. What did my mom say to you guys? Was it just like legal advice? Well, we didn't have all of the information that we have today. Um, it was legal advice, and she's the one that recommended we go to the cold case investigator and oh. say police to see if there was any opportunity to prosecute. So, so your mom, your mom died in two thousand six, two thousand eight. So she was still at the DA's office. So she no, no. The DA. Yeah, she was just a She ran for DA. Yeah. Okay. She always I, goes to DeChamps and Well Board. I remember correctly, it was somewhere around that, that time. Um, it, it was in her office at her house. Yes, that's right. Um, and that's when, and then so then my mom eventually got her shit together and went to the cold case yeah. investigator. The highlighting is me and the redacting is me. It's you? Yeah. So you have a clean copy? Yeah, very clean. No. I don't know. I yes, mean, no. as a this is that. crazy. He said, "Well, I didn't hit Jacob that day." Right. There's a lot of stuff he said that was. He's such a fucking piece of shit. Yeah. That's why we need to go hard. If you would like me to help you with this letter, then maybe we could have Edna look at it before we send it to them, so she can jazz it up. I mean, this is this is no different than than a lot of other dead baby cases that are provable. That makes me feel better because you know you start to ask yourself questions like, well, well, maybe they didn't have enough evidence, or or maybe you know maybe they really do think I did this, or you know like all those things start to go through your mind as to why why it didn't happen, why nothing happened. Because do you think about like? The, the the criminal standard of like beyond or let me correct if I'm wrong. Obviously, I am no lawyer. Although it's I play like one on TV. Law and order. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know the criminal standard is uh, you know beyond a reasonable doubt. 
So historically, he admits that he has this pattern of abusive behavior. If you were thinking about what is a statistical chance that it was you that ultimately caused the death of a child, yeah. putting it against his already admitted pattern of behavior, that's less likely to. Well, I mean, the I thing is, there. is that here's the thing. <clears throat> right. So the thing is, is that the somewhere somebody talks about him not having given the child uh, care. Yeah. I mean, that's... The autopsy report looks like it's saying that it was much more acute. Yeah. So even if you had, you know, kicked him, I mean, you know, my kid, um, when she was eight months old, she rolled off, threw herself off of a couch, bashed her face on the corner of a coffee table, Um, And that left a huge cut. Um, She did that like two or three times over like eight to 11 months. Um, She wrote when she was like four months old, she rolled off the couch, um, off the bed and landed on the concrete like three feet. She fell off down the stairs multiple times and bashed her head on the concrete because she walked at 10 months. And so, I mean... The thing about babies is that is that they bounce, right? I mean, yeah, their bones are soft. Their bones are soft. They their brain, their heads are meant to um, absorb a certain amount of trauma. They're very resilient, right? So even if you had done something to him a month prior, they're not linking it. Well, they're saying that that was healed. That that injury was healed. But that they're saying that the external that the the brain was healed, right? The it looks like there was an external, um, what did they do to him? They had to do surgery to drain fluid out of his uh, brain cavity. But so, there is just simply no way that a six-year-old kicking a kid would have that kind of, uh, force. Babies don't need brain surgery, like, from getting kicked in the head. Right? So let's just assume you kicked him in the head. Like, babies don't need brain surgery from that. (laughs) Why is that? What is that bringing up for you? It's hard to see your name in there. And to see, like, you know, all all this talk about me being jealous of you and my brother and, like... To hear you say that. It's a relief. Because, you know, even though I know I can do that, like, I still hold that, like, being interviewed by the state police at six years old. Do you remember that? No. Do you think you carry, like, the feelings of guilt? Like, as if you did it? Yeah. Yeah. Well, okay, I'm telling you, even if you did it, that's not what killed him, right? So even if you, I mean, what what kind of stuff does, does Elizabeth do stuff to Millie? Yeah, I, just the other day, she forgot <laughs> smacked her right in the face. Yeah. <laughs> like, kids do horrible things to each other. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think my dad got hit in the head with a hammer by his brother when he was, like, four. Rachel threw a rock at Hannah's head <laughs> yesterday. Um, <laughs> Right. <laughs> of course, they're thirty-five. So, <laughs> but I mean, I think that I think that, like, at trial, right? I would, I would, if I were prosecuting this, I would be asking the doctors, like, even if Eric did this, what is the how does that contribute? I mean, it doesn't. Yeah, it doesn't. It just, it just simply doesn't. I mean, I mean. And I think that was, my mom was really smart in that, like, telling him that she was getting me out because I was jealous or whatever, but really, she told me her motivation was to make it so that if something did happen, they wouldn't be able to put it on me. Like, that's what her her thinking was. Yeah. Um, Which is really heartbreaking for me that your mom still couldn't, in the face of, of not, I mean, she clearly didn't trust her instincts. And God only knows, I mean, women... She regrets that. Sure. sure. I mean, there are a million reasons why women don't trust their instincts. Um, Sorry. 
but I mean, I think that even in the face of that, like your mom still found it hard to get away from this guy, yeah. right? Yeah. So she did the next best thing, yeah. which is which was away. to get you away. And you know, I think that moms, we always think that we can protect our kids. Uh, you know, she did everything in her power to keep them from being alone with Jacob. Like she until that night. Right, and, and in her mind, she, her and her mom are like, it's an hour. What's the worst that could happen in an hour? Because you think babies are resilient. But I'm telling you, you did not kill your brother. I knew that part. I just didn't. Of course you know that. I didn't know that the brain surgery <laughs> wouldn't have been a result of me. Like, I started to believe that. You know what I mean? Like, I I started to hold that and carry that because, well, he, like, brainwashed us. I mean, he did. Yeah. To the point where I didn't even know who I was when we left. I didn't know. Because you were eight or nine? Yeah, I was like nine. I was like an empty shell of a child. <laughs> I mean, you you lost everything. Yeah. Yeah, you didn't have a child there. I mean, the stuff coming from your brother's mouth and nose, that's brain fluid. Right. That doesn't happen from you kicking him. Yeah, a month later. Yeah. I mean, that's fine. So where is the autopsy report? Um, I'm just seeing the certificate. There somewhere. There it is. So no, you can didn't. you tell more about um, the, in your office you were saying that there's a uh, victim's program in legal aid? Yeah. What is that? So the victim's program is really more about, well, it's about, so it's kind of weird because it's about, um, it's about enforcing victims' rights, um, with law enforcement or DAs. Right. Okay. But the problem is, is that victims' rights don't technically attach until somebody has been charged. Okay. But what I'm pushing for is that we start doing victims' rights cases prior to that by saying, look, these people have needs that are not being addressed by the criminal justice system prior to the rights attaching, and that maybe it's worth expanding those rights. It's a constitutional amendment that gave victims rights. You can never, the right never includes telling a prosecutor to prosecute versus not, but it's really interesting because, um, so in the same New Mexico, victims' rights also victims have um, access to the uh, Crime Reparations Commission, the Victims' Crime Reparations Commission. So you can request certain funds, like say, for example, a child um, burial was what's that burial funeral expenses, oh yeah or like, like lost a, wages or maybe a child was like abusing her bed and she doesn't want that bed anymore. They can create a petition to get like a new bed. Um, therapy um, for maybe your mom for you like so he did not have shaken baby no. yeah so shaken baby is actually a lot easier to do like that's something that I could have done I mean you no I think that just tells me that he really intended to hurt him he, he right. had to because normally shaken babies in a response to the crying that he, he had to have really wanted to hurt him to make that happen in such a short amount of time, too. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think I have a couple questions, I guess. Yeah. What do you think needs to... And this is probably a bigger question that may not be able for you. You might not be able to answer it, but what do you think needs to change in this state? Like, we have... Like, I feel... And maybe this is just my emotion, but I feel strongly that this kind of issue continues happen. It continues over and over and over again and varying degrees of success with prosecuting people who, who do this type of thing. Um, what do you think needs to change? Well, I, question. I think I think that um, this is kind of a philosophical answer, so I'll give my philosophical answer and then kind of maybe a more legal answer, but I think that um, I think that we as a society really need to kind of draw a line in the sand about abusive people. Yeah. And and it's sort of like a chicken and the egg kind of a conversation. And um, in my experience, 
people who rape and strangle and commit child abuse and animal abuse, they're not amenable to treatment. So on some level, these people are out there perpetrating at, at, at best their philosophy about life and interactions with women and children, right? So, so even if they never go on to physically abuse somebody, the, the mindset to me is really pathological. And I think that, um, I think that what we know about trauma is we know that trauma is passed down. It can be passed down during pregnancy. even. So, so kiddos who are growing up in homes where their mom is being abused and mom is pregnant, those kiddos are being impacted and traumatized even at birth. And that's called developmental trauma. So it's different than post-traumatic stress disorder. It's developmental trauma that happens as they're being formed. And we know that as that's happening, it also shortens their DNA. So it's making generations less resilient in their DNA. It's causing an evolutionary change. So I think that like a lot of the stuff, the, the like alcoholism and drug abuse that we're seeing, particularly like in indigenous communities, I feel like we're starting to see this real, um, the, the life, the evolutionary change in these communities that have been so devalued for generations, right? So poor people, women, women of color, native indigenous people. I feel like genetically those kids are, they're being given the short end of the stick prior to even being born. And sort of regardless of what their mom may be doing to change that dynamic. But the good news is, right, is that kids are resilient and those effects can be um, mitigated. So have you ever heard of ACEs, Adverse Childhood Experiences? So you should really go look up ACEs because I think that you would be like, holy shit, I score really high on ACEs. So ACEs are, stands for Adverse Childhood Experiences, and it's a test. And the test is 10 questions. Has this happened to you? Did this happen to you? Did this happen to you as a kid? The higher you score, technically, the more likely you are to be fucked up, right? But I think that the correlation also is that the higher you score, the more likely you are to be doing the kind of work like that I'm doing. So you are, or this, so, or, this yeah. or like... It, it, there are these huge pockets of resiliency contained within those ACEs. Yeah. And absolutely, some people never recover from that stuff. And the, or some people turn into that, right? They turn into that. or I mean, and, and there's, there's a continuum of behaviors that correlate to the ACEs. But I think that just as hopeful there's, there's resiliency. Humans are resilient people. And so I think that, for me, what I keep coming back to is, what are we doing to kids? What how are we supporting kids? And because like for me, so many of these guys, by the time they get to me, I'm like, you're beyond all hope. And I'm quite a cynic. I, I, I mean, I think the majority of my friends would say that I'm very cynical in that I'm like, they're, they're beyond hope because that's been my experience anecdotally and statistically. I mean, I worked in the prosecutor's office for 10 years with this population so I think that um, we need to really start looking at early intervention. We need to s start supporting programs in schools that are teaching kids how to process shame and conflict in a way that allows kids, because kids will say things that we then shame them for saying. Right. Even like, like sex abuse, like one of the things that people never talk about with sex abuse is that little kids do feel arousal in a positive way when they're being sexually abused. And that's totally normal, right? So like, instead of when you say to kids being sexually abused is bad. And they feel shame for, they feel shame for feeling good. Right? That makes sense. And like, that's not okay, right? There has to be a different way to talk about it. So for me, I just keep going back to, I'm not going to change the 25 year old that I'm dealing with now, but how can I, how can I live in a world 
where kids, my daughter's age or whatever, are thinking about violence and thinking about consent and thinking about sex and joy and how do we get kids to talk about it? So, I mean, I, I just keep kind of coming back to that. And it's hard for me to say that because then it makes it look like my contributions are sort of on the back end when everything's so fucked up. There's no more hope. But I think, unfortunately, you still need people like me who are working on that back end. But so, I mean, I think I think we need to spend a lot more time front loading services for kids. Yeah. Um, and I think we need to do more to support kids staying with moms and dads who are not perfect. Um, but on the back end, I think that New Mexico, um, we are a very defense friendly state. The majority of attorneys in our legislature are defense attorneys because I'm all about people getting a fair trial. I'm all about sure. people having you know, not being put to death. I'm all about people having access to books in prison. But, like, the trauma that victims of crime are suffering, that's fucking generational, right? So, like, what happened to you, that's going to affect your kid and your kid's kids and your kid's 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 kids. It's going to go to the grave with your mom. And, And the impact is everywhere, right? So, like... Yes, this guy goes to prison and we think, okay, it ends with him, but it doesn't end with him, right? And so, like, for me, I just, I feel very, 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 very strongly about victims of violent crimes and that that New Mexico has a constitutional amendment that puts victims on equal footing. We need to expand that. We need to make the laws, I'm sorry, tougher, in terms of penalties, but also in terms of pretrial detention. We need to look at the impact and the lethality that strangulation presents in our communities and really take that seriously. Strangulation is primarily used by um, offenders in intimate partner relationships, but it's crazy because um, strangulation also... Um, stranglers, this is um, new, new information that just recently has been coming out, that approximately 80% of offenders who kill law enforcement have a history of strangulation in intimate partner relationships. So there's a correlation there between people who strangle and who then also suffers from their violence, that it expands beyond intimate partners, right? So we can say like, oh, we don't care about domestic violence victims. But even if you don't care about domestic violence victims, those people are out in the community. They're engaging with law enforcement in this way. They're engaging with their jobs this way. They're en- th- those are people who have a homicidal mentality, and they're, that is their way of being. There, there's no way that we can cleanse a domestic violence offender's worldview and say they only behave this way at home. They don't. And so... In my mind, we have to make domestic violence kind of at the forefront of the way that we, the lens through which we view all crime. Because if you have high score, high ACEs scores, okay, meaning you witness domestic violence in the home, um, a homicide or death of a parent, jail by a parent, but uh, domestic violence is one of the primary indicators. If you have that kind of um, ACEs, right, why are we not? We need to look at that domestic violence framework as a lens of even preventative work for kiddos, for example. And, like, if you have a high ACE score and you're low-functioning, you're poor or you don't have access to education or whatever, and you turn into a drug addict, you're going to be out there committing property crimes. But you you have this underlying kind of predisposition. So why are we not throwing resources at that stuff? And I think that prosecution needs to be restructured through that lens. I think that legislation needs to be restructured through that lens. I think child welfare needs to be restructured through that lens. And I think education, I think medicine needs to be restructured through that lens. The way New Mexico prioritizes things is so ass backwards. So statistically, we, New Mexico and Arizona, have the, the highest rates of high ACE accounts for children, and we're some of the least populated states, and we have the highest rates of poverty, yet we are paying our incoming men's basketball coach $700,000, but a prosecutor in the DA is looking to break 42, 
there's no and a, a CYFD employee oh, yeah, is 38. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So they're doing these high level and they're expected to carry these huge burdens with no sort of um, compensation, not only salary wise, but thinking about the toll that it takes the trauma, the yeah. experience. And so how are you going to get people who are want to dedicate themselves to these fields and do a good job every day when they get shit on by the community and they're not compensated? And law enforcement, too, frankly. I mean, yeah, law enforcement. Yeah, I mean, I think that cops, in one way, we expect them to be the most knowledgeable about the law, yet they're the least educated about the law, right? So, like, yes, judges are highly educated, but most judges stay within their niche, right? So criminal law judges, they only do criminal law. Family law, only family law. The family law statutes are only 50 pages long. Cops were like, you you need to know about traffic law. You need to know about jaywalking. You need to know about landlord tenant. You need to know about sex crimes against kids. You need to know about homicides. You need to know about DV. You need to be trauma informed. You need to know how to interview people. You need to know how to write a report. You need to know how to, I mean, seriously? Like, these fucking people are making... 40, 50, maybe? If that. Maybe, yeah. With high school educations. And I don't necessarily think that the answer is to make them get a college diploma, but so much of this is training and experience, particularly with domestic violence, because while the the MO is very, very much the same, right? Like, I can look at your case and say, this is very normal, but factually and... And factually, it's very similar in terms of, like, he strangled me, he did this, he did that, he said this, he said that. The toll that it takes on you, your mom, the rest of your family, is is what makes the variable so much more interesting, right? And so, like, like how we expect cops to wade through that, to me, is mind-boggling. And so I think, I mean, it's a lot of reform. Yeah. But it's... To me, it's not more money. It's just about shifting the changing, priorities. Changing the focus. Mm-hmm. And I like that's my goal with this whole podcast is to change the conversation. To have a conversation in the first place. Because I feel like the average citizen in the state, if they're not exposed to this in a personal level, if they don't experience this type of thing that you know, happened to my family... Unless they're in, like, social work or some other field where they get exposure to it that way, the conversation really doesn't happen because it doesn't have to. Right. Well, people think it doesn't have to, right? In their mind, it yeah. doesn't have to. Yeah. It has to, in my mind. Yeah. Because I'm, I'm very passionate about, you know, not only just talking about it, but also getting making people aware that, that these, these issues in our state are not going to get better if we just continue to act like they're not happening. And for me, in my situation, I that is the most painful part about this whole thing. And, and I'm, I'm partially to blame for that because I don't willingly share this openly all the time. I'm not talking. I am now. But prior to this, I wasn't talking about it. So I wasn't helping... The situation, either, um, but I, I'm, t- I'm changing my mind on that. You know, I'm, I'm coming out of that, and I think that hopefully the the willingness to do that, hopefully people, other people will want to do that more. And you know, and I want them to talk. Like if they want to talk on my show, they can. That's fine. But um, I think that we also need to look very closely at, at who we're electing and, and who we're, you know, who we put our trust in because they're not willing to stand up for victims and I don't want them in office I think that with victims certainly domestic violence right we always find a way to blame yeah. the victim Every time. kiddos harder to blame kiddos but you got blamed, I got blamed. right and and you're you're sick so who cares like he's not gonna yeah. He's never going to know he was being blamed. He's never going to have to reconcile that with his mom, right? Like, like if it were my mom, I would be, like, super pissed, but then also just completely understanding. And it's like, it's like, it's like this level of heartbreak that yeah. is just fundamental, right? It cuts and like, you in a way that you can't. You can't even process. Yeah. And, and I, um, we always blame the victims. We always blame People the would, victims. But at the end of the day, we we fail. We lose sight of blaming the perpetrator. They did this. Thanks again for listening to True Consequences. 
follow us on social media on Instagram and Facebook at True Consequences Pod and on Twitter at True Cons Pod. True Consequences is hosted, written, and produced by me, your host, Eric Carter Landine. Thanks for listening and stay safe, New Mexico.